Hi there, everybody, and welcome to our session today. My name's Martin Giles. Uh, I'm a senior editor in the senior uh, Silicon Valley Bureau of Forbes, and I'll be your panel moderator. I'm going to briefly set up the framework for our discussion today, and then introduce you to the great speakers who'll be tackling with me the important subject of how startup nations can maintain their impetus both during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Now that poses an immediate question. I mean, what is a startup nation? Um, of course, there are kind of the classic cases like Israel with its close military technology kind of connections, its very highly educated workforce, small domestic economy, its startups kind of expand very quickly internationally. Then we have examples like China and India, where huge domestic markets and kind of burgeoning entrepreneurial activity are really feeding kind of uh, growth in startups. And we've already seen, you know, some amazingly large companies and impressive companies come out of it. I'm thinking in China of companies like Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu, and in India, companies like uh, Olacar and Snapdeal. Then, of course, there's Europe. Uh, where every country is kind of focused on trying to grow its startup ecosystem. And the European Union has specific policies aimed at kind of building a regional startup activity. So it's kind of like a mega startup region, uh, as well as kind of national uh, policies there. There's Latin America that's got countries like Chile and Brazil that have been working hard to build their own startup ecosystems. And then, of course, there's America. Uh, as I said, I sit in Silicon Valley, which likes to think of itself as kind of a prototypical startup ecosystem uh, that others are modeled after. And, and there are other kind of entrepreneurial hubs across the nation. And for the purposes of our discussion today, we're going to consider all of these as startup nations, or at least kind of nations that care very, very deeply about startups. And it's not hard to see why. Startups are more likely to invest in cutting edge innovation and they can sometimes impact activity in other parts of the economy. So they have big knock on effects. They open up new markets or completely reinvent existing ones. And they're significant creators of new jobs. And that's really important at a time when COVID-19 is kind of destroying uh, work in many industries. Now, what's interesting to me is that kind of compared with 2007, 2008, you know, the financial crisis back then, um, you know, we haven't really seen startup funding dry up. You know, kind of back then the tap turned off almost overnight. Um, you know, data from the U.S. National Venture Capital Association shows that funding activity has remained pretty strong this year. Okay, I'm talking about the U.S. here. We've also had a wave of big in initial public offerings, including several this week. Um, with mature tech startups coming to market, it feels kind of good. But there's strain. There are signs of strain. Deal activity is beginning to drop, and we've seen the lowest level of exit since 2011. So even in America, things are tough. So what should nations care deeply about? So what should nations who care deeply about startups be doing to help support young companies during these turbulent times? Now, we could have a whole conference on that subject, but in the next kind of 55 minutes, uh, myself and my panelists are going to focus on some of the most important areas that we think policymakers, firms and entrepreneurs everywhere should include in their roadmap for revival. And uh, there are some brilliant minds here with me today who've been focused on this task. So let me now introduce my panelists. When I mention you team members, could you just wave your hands and say hi so everyone knows who you are? We have Suman Bose, who is the co-founder of GoFar Advisory and Investments in Singapore. Say hi, hi. Suman. Excellent. Hi. We have Pernilla Hipperbrun, a strategic advisor who's the founder of Memento in Denmark, which is an independent nonprofit executive network organization. Hi, Pernilla. Great to have you. We have Luba Greenwood, who's a lecturer at Harvard University in the U.S. and a healthcare and tech investor. Hi, Luba. Hi, how are you? Great. And Svana uh, Gunasdottir, sorry, Svana, I knew I was going to fall on that second name. Svana Gunasdottir, who's the founding partner of Frumtac Ventures in Iceland. 
And last but not least, Guan Ming Li, the co-founder of Colorful Cloud in China. Great name, I love it. Colorful Cloud, which uses AI to drive a popular weather forecasting app and translation software. Guan Ming Li, great to have you with us. Okay, so I'm going to ask each one of my panelists to make a few opening comments. And then after that, we're going to dive into the discussion. So let's start with Luba. Luba, great to have you with us. What do you think uh, nations should be focusing on when it comes to thinking about how to keep their entrepreneurial engines running? Uh, well, great question. Thank you. Uh, and, and again, it's uh, wonderful to be here and I look forward to our discussion. Um, I have to say the key is collaboration. So post-COVID, um, there are a lot of jobs were lost. Um, there's a lot of nervousness in the economy. And usually that means for many governments um, and for many companies to, um, to do less collaboration. Um, and I would say the focus should be the opposite, especially in areas um, such as in healthcare, uh, where we do see enormous growth. So while it's true, um, as you had mentioned, that IPOs and, and investment has dried up across uh, many industries. It's actually the opposite in the industry that I'm in, in healthcare, and especially in the intersection between tech and healthcare, uh, because um, you know that's the industry that is connecting patients uh, worldwide to physicians and to healthcare services. Um, and we've actually seen a number, um, billions of dollars that were raised just in the last year, even during COVID, um, and also billions that are being deployed in the state. So, uh, but however, that is all great news. Um, and as you know, uh, usually the post crisis funds and a post crisis investment, either by the government or private investment, uh, usually those companies tend to do better, um, than, you know, kind of post crisis vintages, they call them, than, um, that then during the, the boom time. So, um, uh, but again, when I say better, usually that means that uh, a lot of these companies have um, you know, a lot of collaborations, a lot of partnerships. They rely on partnerships and collaborations worldwide with companies. They rely on support uh, from governments uh, all over the world. Uh, they rely and also rely, most importantly, on talent all over the world, right? They, both of the most successful companies and startups are built across nations by um, by people that come from, from different backgrounds and in, in local world. So I would say the key is to keep that going in the healthcare and tech space, but make sure for the government to encourage more collaboration and allow for talent flow in the company. Yeah, I, I think it's a really important point you made there. It's kind of like, you know, to borrow from Charles Dickens, it's the best of times and the worst of times. It was his opening line from The Tale of Two Cities, my favorite management consultant. He, you know, basically, there are certain sectors like healthcare, and I think you know, anybody who's in work from home tech, where you, you're actually seeing a lot of growth and a lot of investment interest. So it's not kind of like a, a picture, a bleak picture across the board. A really, really important uh, point. So, thank you for that, um, Ming Li. Uh, do you want to give us your thoughts from China? Yeah, uh, we all suffered from pandemic uh, globally. Uh, for example, retiring uh, tourism, restaurant, and uh, small businesses were deeply hurt. At the same time, large companies uh, had to focus on their core business to uh, But people also proved their resilience under the difficulties. Yeah. In China, for example, in China, uh, the delivery service played a significant role uh, in keeping daily life running smoothly when the restricted social distance was applied. Uh, they also share their expertise in managing uh, the complex logistic tasks when Wuhan was in danger. People uh, leverage their privacy uh, to allow technical companies uh, or the government to monitor their tracing to keep the public safe uh, in the United States and China. But uh, this stirred some controversies in Europe. Yeah. Um, the online conferencing system uh, become mandatory for remote working, but uh, online education is almost the only way to choose uh, to assure children's safety. Uh, so the above effects urge us to study the roles tech companies and their platforms uh, will play in boosting innovations under the pandemic. And I give my points as below. Yeah. Um, 
tech companies can foster opportunities on their platforms to enable the innovation power of individuals and uh, small businesses. And uh, the AI community should encourage researchers and companies uh, to seek creative solutions since the pandemic will last for years. And finally, uh, we need to unite and boost the whole society to overcome the difficult time we face today. Great, uh, really important comments, really important points. I think about you know, a societal response, absolutely. We need to think about every layer of society and the importance of kind of what existing tech platforms can do to support the other startups that are in an ecosystem. We'll, we'll pick that up in a little bit. And I think you know, your point again about sort of delivery services. Yeah, this has actually been kind of like, almost like, again, great times for delivery services because everyone's at home and needs stuff delivered. They don't want to go out to stores. So again, a mixed picture here. Wonderful. Um, Pernilla, you want to go next? A view from Denmark. Yes. So this is a very interesting time where we see a lot of different companies and governments and people and NGOs coming together to really try to solve the problems we are facing. And uh, I think what we need to really nurture in the in the coming years is that cross collaboration across countries and governments and people and businesses. And, and like Mingli just said with their different startup communities in tech and also AI, we have a platform uh, economy that we can build on and where people really tap into that collaborative force. And it's so much needed because a lot of the impedance that we had for, for the startup nations pre-COVID were based on that ability to actually uh, collaborate and building on the entrepreneurial mindset that was fostered and nurtured through a great education and great um, uh, ability to actually get access to funding and, and things like that, not just from one's own uh, part of the world, but also across is, is really important that we can still build on that also in the future. Um, but we are going to face a new world where we are going to collaborate much more online. And in face of that, we need much better tools for that collaboration and abilities to actually connect on also a more personal level. So right now we're sitting here, we are having this panel and it's working. And I'm so grateful that we didn't just you know, conclude that we're going to meet maybe next year physically, but actually trying to do things like this online. But we can also um, connect with the fact that a lot of people feel maybe a little bit lonely sitting at home. And when you foster that startup mindset, you need to be able to be creative and think out of the box and challenge the existing and what's going on. So, so this pandemic has forced us to do that, but we need to really build on the momentum and also make sure that we don't run out of energy because uh, we can build on that adrenaline, build in the beginning of, of a new situation that we have like right now and where everybody wants to try out new things, but then eventually maybe we will need uh, another way of working together. So that's really what I'm, I'm very interested in discussing also at this panel to see how we can we can have tools that can support that cross-border collaboration, whether it's cross-border governments or countries or nations or um, companies or individuals. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think this issue of collaboration kind of almost at every level, how do we kind of step it up? Because when econ you know, economic times are tough, you often see nations kind of turn in on themselves. They start kind of putting up barriers and they think about, themselves first and collaboration gets pushed out of the window and that yeah. can be very bad especially for entrepreneurial ecosystems so we'll pick that theme up it's a really great theme thank you um suman you want to go next yep yeah. uh, thanks for uh, having all of us here uh, i think the the whole uh, discussion uh, around the, the covid the, and, and i i don't think it's still post covid we are in the in the covid times uh, it's uh, it's very important that we realize uh, what it has done to us. And I think the, one of the the thing that it has done is the, it has it has kind of opened up the 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 clear underbelly of uh, it has opened up the crack, shown the cracks of the underbelly of uh, the the world that we that we live in today. Uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, you know today suddenly there is a lot of flurry. Oh, you know the kids are this, these kids can't go to school because the the the, the schools are closed. Uh, but you know, hey, you know, maybe hundred million kids don't go to school at all. 
uh, you know, the, when you talk about, uh, you know, healthcare, or when you, when you talk about, for example, you know, uh, you know I, I, I was, was discussing with somebody the other day, and I said, you know, close to 10 million people die every year for hunger, and hunger is not a pandemic. The, the, the medicine for that, that disease called hunger has been known to humans possibly since, since humans became humans. Since the since the rise of the Homo sapiens, you know, it's called food. Even before that, the animals knew it, and the world destroyed 35 percent of the ready-to-eat food every year, causing climate change problems. So it's a double, triple whammy. Now, now I think the the pandemic has kind of also uh, opened up the underbelly. You know, it's it's cracked. It's, show, it's showing the cracks, and it's also showing. And that's where the I'm, I'm kind of want to kind of link up the whole conversation about the startups. Because it's, it's kind of linking up and saying, you know, the startups were supposed to be, and by the theory, uh, it, it's supposed to be doing the stuff that the big companies fail to do because of their large size and the large bureaucracy. And, and I know I have, I'm the one who served nearly 30 years in, in the, some of these largest of the companies. And I've seen how, you know, despite wanting to go there, we couldn't go there. So we thought that that's the startup space. But what happened to the startup space? For all the deliveries that happening today, it's still very city centric. It's still very uh, urban, urban centric where, you know, it's one choice versus another. And I'm not I'm not 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 against uh, giving people choice. But what I'm against and what I'm when I'm kind of wondering at this point of time and in this with this audience is uh, I think I think it, this is, in my view, an opportunity to press a very large reset button and and rethink. Uh, what these startups are supposed to be? What what is what's the problem that we are trying to solve? Who is that these startups are working for? Are they working for the next check from a venture capital? Are they working for the next valuation rounds they get? Uh, is the conversation only about the you know the the clawbacks and the and are those the conversations? Are are the conversations really about uh, what uh, and how the 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 beyond the one and a half, two billion people of the world who, are, who possibly have all the choices. So that's in my view. And that's where I think I, I agree to the collaboration point of view because some of the collaborations are needed because the, the opportunity lies, for example, in, in say, serving in, in Africa or serving in India, where the startup can be collaborating out of Israel, which is a small market, but which has a potential to build something fascinating with say, uh, the tech corridor of the Boston or with the Valley or with, uh, you know, with, with Denmark, India, etc. Right. Yeah. So this is how, my, my belief is, uh, this is how the, the, the next generation of the startups will come to the fore. Got it. So, so, I mean, I think this point about the, you're making very strongly about the digital divide and how kind of the current crisis could actually ex exacerbate that divide is really important. Um, and we will come to that, I think, on multiple kind of points as we go into the discussion. So that is really great that you raised it here. I think kind of what is the societal responsibility of big companies, of entrepreneurs, of, kind of investors? Those are really interesting questions. And again, I'm sure we'll touch on all of those as we come through our kind of roadmap for revival. So I really appreciate you kind of laying that out. Thank you. And last but not least, Svana from Iceland. Your, your yeah, thought? I have just said about this micro uh, impact. I'm sure this will be it's just the beginning of a big wave of changing the world. But if I zoom back a little bit into uh, micro uh, here, uh, I think it was good that you mentioned in the beginning about the financial crisis because we were just starting our first fund during that time. And we see a big difference in that sense how the landscape is then and now. Uh, it's really uh, booming in, in funding wise. There is enough. I will come back on that. But uh, I agree on the highlights of uh, the two words like collaboration and connection. I mean, this is where it's all based on. We can see it. I mean, you said startup nation. If I just speak about Iceland, I mean, we are just simply startup nation. I mean, we are sailors by heart, and you have to leave your eyes off the land if you want to explore the ocean. You know, so we really go out there, you know, and then we have to build some practical people around us to make it uh, into something real and we don't die simply on, on the sea. So uh, we can feel a big difference uh, if I just take it from here, and I think you can really multiply that. Uh, uh, and that's uh, also a strong point of a small nation that the government has come to the, the collaboration between you know, the government, the investors, companies, startup community, we all kind of run into, and we all in the same box. 
So everybody is going in the same direction. So we are seeing things happening very quickly. We have been trying to get through for the last battle. And I think that's really, really good. And if we, you know, a lot of people are questioning, you know, is lockdown really hampering innovation and creativity? And I have to say, um, we have never experienced more openness uh, and willingness and somehow people are thinking also in the same direction in the way of investing to support responsible investments. How do you, where do you want to put your money in what way? People are much more aware of that. So I think we will, you know, this will put this on the next level also in the sense of what we are going to invest in and how we want to see the world going forward. For sure. Yeah, I, think, I think that's really interesting. I mean, obviously, you're not running a charity. You know, investors are there to make returns for their investors. So one needs to think about that. But at the same time, as you said, you know, this is this is a unique period. Everyone says unique, um, you know, unprecedented. I like discombobulated. That's a great word because it basically means confusing and kind of like scary. It's a discombobulating time. So we all need to think kind of differently. It's encouraging us to to kind of all collectively kind of question what we need to do. And that is exactly what we're going to do now. You guys have done a fantastic job of setting up our discussion. Um, so let's kind of dive into a few areas where kind of like we want to give some concrete kind of advice to policymakers, to firms, to individuals. Um, I mean, one area, it's kind of like financial strain. Yes, there are some some sectors like healthcare and kind of work from home where startups are doing really well. But there's kind of many others where they're actually struggling because the core markets they serve, whether it's anything from travel to kind of retail, whatever, are decimated. So what should governments do? What should we be thinking about in terms of how we help them? And I'm, for example, Germany, I know, has unveiled a 2 billion euro I think it's about $2.2 billion plan to aid startups directly or give money, it will give money, it will take stakes in startups alongside other companies. Um, some other nations like Chile who are doing a smaller kind of scale thing. It's got about a quarter of a million dollars for science-based startups where it's going to invest the government and take stakes. I think cities are looking at this for their kind of investment funds in certain countries. Is that the way to do it? I mean, should we be helping directly the startup ecosystem with with taxpayers' money, or are there other way, better ways to help? Who wants to take that question first? Okay. Luba, you got there first. Your green lighted up. So Luba, you go first. It's going to be a race here. Go, go, Luba. Well, no, I, I don't want. I don't want the American to go. No, they no. <laughs> All right, then Penilla goes first. All right. So, yeah, so there's uh, definitely a lot governments can do to to make sure that uh, they have enough money to even survive, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to to uh, only be in the order of where you give them money. It could also be conserving money so that uh, those who got off the ground and who are there and who are struggling to survive, that you don't ask them to pay their taxes for the first uh, 12 months or uh, anything where they, they can actually conserve the cash they, that they do have so that they don't um, die. That's, that's another way of doing it than thinking of funneling all the money from the government into those uh, companies because as I'm sure somebody else will build on this, but it doesn't necessarily help them that, that you give them money and then it's just kind of like you, you don't have to fight for it. And there's something about this hungriness in startups that's not necessarily bad. Yeah, and, and I have to say, I couldn't agree more. I, absolutely, right? There are two things that governments can sort of do. They can do more regulatory support of tax incentives, right? Basically incentives to help the companies. Uh, but uh, from what we've seen, and this is one of the reasons why in the United States, startups are doing so well. Um, and again, many, many of those startups uh, um, are not U.S. Started startups, right? There are startups that have started um, in, in other countries, in, in Israel, in China, in Denmark, France, and other areas, and then they come um, and they grow in the United States. And one of the reasons is because the government um, is not, for example, giving them money, right? The government is also staying away from dictating what are the areas where you should be going, right? So a lot of these government efforts on in saying, well, this is an area that we, for example, Martin, as you, as you mentioned, 
We have the travel industry that's decimated. Let's help the travel industry, right? We have, um, you know, the food industry, the meatpacking industry that's decimated. Let's help them. So anytime the government does that, there's almost a backlash and, and nobody wants to do that. Um, and you're absolutely right that you want the, comp the, the startups to be hungry. And on the regulatory side, so obviously tax incentives is one of the reasons why you have these hubs in, in uh, for example, in California, you have one in Boston. A lot of that goes to some of those tax incentives and, um, and other incentives that are provided. One area where government, and including the U.S. government, could do a much better job is most regulations are geared at um, and to protect um, and help large industries and very large companies function. Um, and if anything, they pivot um, and make it much more startup um, to do anything, right? I mean, this is the case, not just all the but let's, sorry, Louis, just to interrupt you, I'd, I'd like to come to the regulatory stuff a little bit later. I, I really want to stay kind of focused on on the tax issues, on the money, the money question, if you like. So, yeah, so, so, so let's come the back money to question, definitely, I, I would say, no, I mean, yes, I, I would say on the money question, I, we haven't seen evidence um, of, except for some small evidence in Israel, uh, where giving money um, by the government is actually helpful for startups. Ming Li, what, what's China's approach to this? I mean, there's the government level and then kind of city level. I mean, how how is China thinking about supporting startups? Yeah, the, the government cut rate and they reduce tax uh, to stimulate the economy. Uh, but some in some cities, they also uh, provide uh, packages. Yeah, they, they send vouchers directly to every citizen. And I think uh, in this way, we can set up a... a uh, a bottom-up way, uh, uh, the, maybe the, the government can consider some inclusive uh, ways to to send to send the, the, the vouchers. But the startups can do the optimized work. They can uh, solve the problems. Yeah. That's really interesting. So the vouchers, so I get a voucher as a citizen, and I, I have to. Sp I can only spend it with a startup, a certain sort of set of companies, or is it a voucher that I could spend on anything? Not not anything, but uh, some some for example some some stores uh, in in the center of the uh, city. Got it. So it's kind of like a, a a specific kind of incentive for a part of the economy that, that the government wants to support or that the city wants to support. Yeah, that's interesting. And what about kind of is there any kind of direct tax incentives to to Chinese companies, the startups? Like I'm thinking, for example, you know, maybe you could just say, hey, you don't have to pay your registration fees this year. Yeah. We'll give you a year's break. Do they do things like that? Yeah, uh, they have some measure, measures to ease the burden of startups. For example, yeah, uh, they defer the tax payments, uh, reducing the rent, uh, and even uh, they subsidizing uh, RD uh, cost. They have several uh, issues, several measures. Got it. Fantastic. Um, Svana. Yeah, you see, I cannot wait to, to speak, you know, here because I have a strong, very strong view on this. And I totally agree you should not give money. You know, free money is not good uh, in this sense. And if we go with the start of uh, as such, uh, the government, I mean, nine out of ten starts will go broke anyway, despite COVID. And the government should not be in the position to select who is going to get money and who not. Uh, but of, of course, on the other hand, the government realizes, you know, this is the biggest source of job creation, you know, things like that. So they definitely need to support it and be able to be sustainable. Uh, so so it's quite hard to hear you. I think our, our global internet connection to Iceland is is not doing so well at the moment. So you can, you maybe can, you, you can, can maybe I can switch to Zoom and perhaps you just re okay. reboot and come in again, and then I'll come back to you because I know you've got some really strong views and I want to make sure everyone <laughs> hears them properly. Zoom, let me switch to you. So I'm going to come back in. Um, so what do you think? I mean, what's the what's, how is India? So so one, is, one is what I think and another is what I see. And, okay. you know, I, I, thinking wise, I don't think the governments in most places, uh, and especially in democracies, are, are the best uh, uh, spenders of public money in terms of especially in, in investment uh, vehicle decisions. Uh, 
you know what what's how do you value a startup i want i want to give you money and take an equity how do i value your equity if the travel industry is not going to come back for the next 5 years how long how deep the hole will i pour the money in so i think uh, government is personally that's my thinking but you know however we you know we also have elected governments who have to win votes and depending upon uh, you know you know their promises and they and, and the optics uh, we have we, we also see behavior distortions and uh, especially for some of the smaller countries or uh, smaller entities or the cities you know when you get get it over there i think they have a reputation to keep so they sometimes give out money but i personally do not believe that's the right way to do rather in fact one of the thing that i want to just make an observation you know i was i i i do sit on the board of quite a few accelerators across the world and of recent i suddenly started seeing during the covid times that the the companies that are coming into the accelerators they are far older then typically you would see companies coming into accelerators so one of the things and, and, and the data is out not there but i believe what has happened is a lot of companies which are between 12 to 16 months kind of an old in the seed to pre a kind of a stage of investment have already folded down now that uh, the impact of this you know i'm sure you know there would be governmental studies there would be private institutions that will study and figure out what's happening but i've definitely seen that in india i've definitely seen that in singapore i'm also noticed that in parts of europe that the cohorts of the accelerators are the age of the age cohorts are, in, are gone up so that means something has happened to those companies which are 12 to 16 months old now there are two things that 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 comes to my mind one is as a as an investor to repurpose some of those as assets into some of my existing assets or some of the other asset and see how they can be repurposed because there is a lot of especially technology can have multiple manifestations the other one is the talent because finally the talent is what we are all talking about and the startup is is manifested by the talent so the talent is can is easily repurposable so if the government has to play a role finally i believe play the role with the talent uh not with the startup because the talent is is a national asset can we we're on on the money question again i just come back to that it's like so your your view is very strongly don't give money directly um maybe think yeah. you know encourage the investment community to think about how it can support startups and talent, and so and talent. stand back to other stuff right yeah i know that i'm summarizing but yeah, yeah. I just okay, want to add to that. Because... Let's try Svana again. Sorry, I just want to go back to Svana okay. and see if we can right. go back. I just I'm talking to Svana. He, he, we're, I feel like we're connected. Uh, I have I have a lot of the same um, uh, observations I have to say on the US, the US side. But yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about and then the, the previous comment that Svana made. Uh, extraordinarily important for us to discuss. I think here uh, because we can't move as as the world without. Addressing, I think, the, the, the initial comment uh, that one made. But yes. Okay, Swana, just come back to you. Let's try again. Yeah, can you hear me now a little bit better? Yes, much better. How much uh, did, did you not hear at all what I said uh, previously? I start again. Just do it very briefly. Just yeah. go from the top. It's yeah. really important, so I want to make sure. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I, I, I totally agree with what they're just saying. You know, we should not give money or have any free money. You know, uh, at, at this, and like I said, you know, it's a startup uh, companies. Nine out of ten will fail. So, which one? If the government is giving away, which one to choose? You know. Uh, so, uh, what we have seen here is that the government has stepped in in a quite a, a impressive way. The commerce left in, because usually we see in the companies uh, the revenue is probably uh, taking longer to get the revenue, so they will actually have funding need earlier. and they will not be able to fundraise because they are not showing the increase in revenue so uh, to stimulate this they have given they talk to the investors so when we invest and in the company we believe just to give them more uh, oxygen to live longer they will come in as the last resort on the same terms so the government is not dictating they're not making the terms they just come on the same uh, as any other investor into the companies and i think that's very healthy interesting so a mix of kind of views i think what we've got here it's like sometimes it's like just keep back others it's like think about i think most importantly i mean what i'm taking away from this section is kind of think creatively about it are there ways in which you can help companies without directly giving them money if you do have to invest as a government for example then think intelligently about how you do it try not to like crush the creative spirit that comes from private sector investment luba any yeah. view go uh, 
Very briefly, yes, because when we talk about money and giving money, I think we have to go a little bit also a higher level. And this is kind of going to Suman's point is that the government also regulates interest rates, right? So that goes back to how much money is available for investors to invest. And so that's, you know, the again, the government, and maybe I'm going back to policies. I'm sorry, Martin, I keep on going back to the We're policies. Coming We're coming there. <laughs> Some money point, right? Which is if the got you know, how do you actually what are your policies with respect to making money available, right? Uh to different in to basically different types of money that's out there, right? And goes back to the monthly, you know, point, which is, you know, who is giving money as an investor, right? There are tons of different types of investors and they're the ones that are driving exactly what is happening at the startup level. So one of the things that we see, just to echo what Suman was saying, is that we see, for example, there's lots of money that's been raised, but that money is going to, because as an investor, I'm thinking, I want that money to go into these more established startups. So they're not even real startups, right? I want that money to go further. So I am, I'm going to go less on the actual startup startups that are sort of 12, 18 months. I'm going to redirect that money so that there's a lot more that's being put in sort of the established companies. Um, and there isn't that much left. And even on the talent side, I'm going to repurpose some of those others that I'm going to shut down and kind of incorporate them into these larger startups, but they're no longer really startups. So the government is doing a lot on, in terms of interest rates and, and other policies that affect, you know, who is giving money. And just very quickly to Suman's earlier point about, well, why don't we have, you know, startups that are doing a lot of things for social good? And why is it when we're looking at the recent companies that have IPO'd, none of them have, have revenues? And none of them really uh, address any issues in the developing world and even in the developed world for underserved populations, right? So people that live outside of these metropolis areas, um, again, that goes back to who investors are and they're sort of driving a lot of these decisions. Um, I mean, I can tell you just briefly from previous, you know, no, my I don't think you need to excuse the investment community for what it does. I mean, it does what it does very well. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure we move on because I knew that would take a lot of a reasonable amount of time because it's a controversial issue. But let's keep going. Collaboration. I want to come to this point about collaboration, which touches on some of these other issues. Um, you know, Ming Lee, I know that you were talking about kind of platform responsibilities. Can you just like expand on that? I mean, why should Tencent or Alibaba, what's it for them? They run their own businesses, right? They have their own responsibilities to make money. Why should they do anything charity wise to support other startups? Yeah, because they are, they are too large. Yeah. They, they penetrate to everyone's life nowadays. Yeah. So we cannot live without them. Yeah. That's the basic reason. Yeah. So platform played a critical role yeah, in, in our in modern life. I think. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as everyone knows, Alibaba is the largest uh, Chinese e-commerce company, uh, and uh, uh, they released uh, their plan for a smart manufacturing uh, weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, with the largest market sharing uh, in China. Alibaba connect many uh, customers and retailers uh, on its marketplace. Uh, so the client will open a new platform to connect the factories and the retailers. Uh, the platform will enable uh, the manufacturers uh, to fine tune their uh, business using custom behavior data collected by, by Alibaba. Um, so it's also kind of like a, a, a mutually beneficial thing to do. I, we have a platform. Let's get more startups on it. If they're having trouble, let's try and help them by bringing them on the platform to give them more reach to kind of new, new technologies and new customers. Yeah. Is that, is that yeah. the key point here? Yeah, I think they can help the the the, uh, the factory. They can help them. They can provide the technology to help them. Uh, to set up a connection with uh, with consumers, and uh, this will lead to, uh, I think, uh, a more device, diverse the market in the future. Yeah. Got it. Fantastic. And Penilla, I know you were kind of talking a lot about collaboration. I mean, yeah, you know, how far did this go? And what, what concretely? So let me just. What concrete steps do we do? What are the top three things you would do as a government policymaker? To, to kind of encourage collaboration or as a firm, 
What would you do? Yeah, not necessarily um, as a government, but I think that collaboration that was talking about before was exactly nurturing this entrepreneurial mindset. How do we let's do that? We do that if we make sure that different stakeholders come together. So when we talk about platforms and collaboration there, the big suppliers are obviously dependent on the small suppliers to, to get on the platform and to be there. Uh, that's kind of the, the forest underneath. If you don't have that, you don't survive as a forest in the long run. So, so we want that collaboration to happen and who should foster that? What my point before was, is that if you bring stakeholders together to, to discuss this, you can see incredibly uh, innovative solutions coming out of it. And uh, it's very interesting to see how uh, the World Economic Forum just scored uh, ranks their 10 most innovative countries in the world. And what was a common factor for all of them was how that collaboration takes place between universities, institutions, governments, uh, NGOs, uh, and big companies, of course. And and we've seen a couple of examples of that in our region where we've had um, different stakeholders coming together to try to see if we can solve a problem we have right in front of us. Uh, it could be something with their society. We have societal problems. We have a problem with uh, waste water, whatever, and how the different stakeholders together can solve that problem. And I think that's, that's what we're going to need much more in the future. And the trick, again, is if we cannot meet physically, but we need online tools, how can we maybe develop that innovation uh, using online tools to actually help foster that? So I think we need to invest into, into much better online tools. Um, and 5G obviously is also going to, to be very important when it comes to that. So, so that's a the infrastructure investment behind the infrastructure it. Infrastructure investment. Anna, um, Suman, any, any thoughts you want to build on that? Yeah, maybe, maybe just to evoke some uh, controversy. You know, uh, these are the times when a lot of things can be passed on or, or been, been, can be shoved below the below, below the carpet by in the name of a pandemic response. And one of the pandemic response problem that I see is big companies and or the so-called platforms, which already has 70, 80 percent of the market using their technology and their their cash balance to uh, in name of helping uh, to not help. They're helping themselves. So I think uh, it's important. Uh, that that uh, the government, if the government has a role, the government's role is to govern. And therefore, it is extremely important that the government stays vigilant into this, you know, what is really helping and what is market making and what is creating monopolies, which will tomorrow, because a pandemic at some point of time will go away. That's what we wish. But the, the, the what you saw today, you will use tomorrow. So we have to be very careful because we are already seeing that in name of whether it's the name of security. And, and you know, I know maybe talk about, you know, how Europe reacted to uh, privacy concerns. Now, those privacy concerns are real. And I'm, I, I will have a life beyond the pandemic, hopefully. I, mean, I think it's a really interesting point. And, uh, and, you know, when it comes to like things like antitrust, it's like, you know, how big is big is too big? And we Absolutely. Sort of that in the U.S., you know, with there's sort of likely to be case against Google. I mean, this is, this is the yeah. point in, Martin, if, if tomorrow my payment gateway, because I'm Alibaba or I'm, I'm, I'm eBay or I'm, I'm, I'm Tencent, if my payment gateway becomes China's default payment gateway, then I have a much bigger problem to solve for multiple years. And undoing that is an impossibility. Right. And I think a lot of companies today are trying to take that position. And in name of pandemic response or in name of Doing good is not to, not so much doing good. So I want to be, you know, the, the maybe maybe it's a it's a it's an advantage of taking a, a dissenting voice over here. But I think therefore the government's job is more importantly over here to govern. Yeah, I think it's really important we have dissenting voices. This is a discussion. It's a debate, right? We're trying to hash out the most important policies to follow. So we need to discuss these. We can't all be in agreement on everything. That would be terrible. Svana, I just wanted to come to you. Do you have any thoughts on what you've heard? Echo that. Yeah. Sorry. I want to go to Svana first. Let's go to okay. Svana first. Okay. All right. I, I wish we would have this. this. Okay. Go okay. ahead, Svana. Yeah, okay. I, I, I like this vision. I wish we would have like a united front that one voice government who knew what they wanted to do and went to do and how to do it. 
uh, I would love that scenario. But of course, we need to, 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 to change it. But I think also consumers are getting much more power now, and they are getting much more. I see it in my kids. They they are changing their behavior in this sense to change the world. And I think we will see that much more changing from the money into the consumers, and the money follows that action. I know it's also far fetched, but. Uh, I, I will see that, but I think the governments, uh, they will step in and are stepping in, in this sense. I mean, uh, it's maybe sensitive, TikTok, uh, we might, uh, <laughs> but well, yeah. It's, a, it's great, and it's a great question, right? I mean, it actually brings us on to our next topic, which I know Luba was really keen to get into. So I'm going to start with you, Luba. This is on deregulation more generally, right? I mean, it's like there are a whole set of things. So do you become protectionist? Do you say, actually, I don't want TikTok in America? For whatever reason, so I'm going to come up with a reason that says it's a security risk and use that as, as Suman would say. It's kind of like a cover for actually just protecting my own industries. Um, what, what do we need to think about in terms of a deregulation of other things that might impact startups, allow them to get products to market faster? What do we think need to think about in terms of uh, deregulation, in terms of kind of making sure that skilled immigration goes forward, that we can get smart minds and smart dissenting views into our entrepreneurial ecosystems. You know, when things go bad, people already put up barriers here in the US. We've been putting up a lot of barriers to skilled immigration. So let's just run through these. What are the kind of key issues we need to make sure as policymakers that we address here? Luba, over to you. Great. So, um, so I think we're all in agreement on the on immigration, of course, that, that's a widely known, um, very well researched topic that, of course, if you want talent and so most of the startups in the United States are started by immigrants, the most of the successful ones are started by immigrants. That is, that's, that, that's an obvious point. Um, and uh, so, so that's obvious. That what's much we've been going the other way, right? We've been going yeah. the other way. We've shut down. We're trying to stop more skilled immigration. So I'm not trying to make this an American story. I'm trying to make this. So we that's just right. need to be cognizant that, that yes. barriers tend to close when economies are under stress. And that's bad for ecosystems. But I guess I'm saying is, uh, so that's that's an obvious, so we can, we can have that discussion, but that's kind of an obvious point. What, what's a lot, in terms of regulation, that's a lot more nuanced. I'm trying to get to the nuanced part, is that there's a lot of regulation that is make it really hard for startups to um, to even understand, for example, are you if you're doing risk score and you're you're connecting somebody from an underprivileged um, area to a position, is that you know should is that should that be regulated? Should not not be regulated? Um, even guidance on that uh, should be given. Now, so there's I'm I'm pro less regulation and more explanation of regulation on that side. Now, unfortunately, I just want to say on the regulation where you actually have to Increase, right? The government is so far away. I think government do not understand what a platform technology is. So when you when you said, "Oh, Alibaba," and "Oh, hey, okay, they're helping startups," I'm thinking, "Oh my God, please, no, that, that's bad." That's bad. <laughs> when you said that, but I just can't stop. Right? When Google says that, "Hey, we're going to help the startup, startup thing." The problem you're, you're is the government, up, sorry, I just want to finish. The government does not understand on the technical level what it means to build a platform and on the technical level what it means to be collecting the information by providing these helpful services today. And the third, what it means to also have all these startups on your platform that they fund. Once the government gets that, they should start regulation. It's not just antitrust. Antitrust is picking off low hanging fruit. I'm talking about something much deeper that governments across the world don't understand. Okay. Yeah, we got you back there towards the end, but you broke up in the middle. Okay. So you might just hundred percent agree in agreement. Hundred percent in agreement. Suman's a hundred percent in agreement. Who isn't in agreement? Ming Lee, what do you think? You were saying Alibaba and Tencent, they're they're kind of here to help. These two are saying, no, actually you've got to really worry about them because they could actually hurt entrepreneurial activity when economies are, are struggling. Do you do you disagree with that? Uh, I I think uh, the the flow of ideas is helpful for for startup. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 absolutely a, a good idea to to make the the, the 
uh, creativity uh, ideas uh, all brought us, uh, among the world. Yeah. So the flow, keep ideas flowing, keep commerce flowing, keep interactions yeah. flowing. Yeah. So if you, you hope that, that these large companies will actually be good partners as opposed to bad partners. So yeah. I think that's really where we, we leave that. Um, so yeah, that's, about, that, that's how they keep the competition away, you know, and keep it all under control. So I agree, it's, it's a very dangerous uh, move to go. Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure we keep moving because we've got actually 10 minutes left and we've got like a bunch of areas to cover, at least two other important areas. One, I mean, we've kind of touched on this and it's kind of maintaining like support for critical technologies, fundamental research that, that then startups can actually take and, and monetize. And that is something, again, when times are tough, governments start to kind of think about what should be cut. Oh, maybe we could just cut a bit of R&D here and there. We don't need to worry about that. I mean, what should policymakers, again, be thinking about? Should we prioritize certain areas? And if so, which ones matter most to the startup ecosystem? Who wants to go first on that? If I just say a bit how we have done, how the government has done it here, they definitely doubled it. They make it much uh, bigger. They do it more often. And uh, uh, so they're giving the money out quicker. And they put more into the seed states because that's really the most difficult state to fund. Like you were said, uh, the companies between, you know, up to 18 months, they are like not getting funded if they don't have any traction at this time. So they are making sure that the little trees are being, you know, at least the roots and keep them alive. So we will not have a generation missed there. So I, I think that's really good. And they do seed and they do uh, research and product and some marketing as well. So uh, they, I, I believe in that. Uh, that's really supportive. Anybody else want to? I have, a, I have a, 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 a point to make over here in terms of both the government as well as uh, investors. And I think I'm going to bring them in together because governments are also in, in a way when they spend taxpayers' money to do basic fundamental research in their research labs and et cetera, they're kind of acting like an investor. There are so many of these researchers and so many of these patents and so many of these, which that Europe is a perfect example. You know, European Union's Horizon 2030 fund, it, it funds billions of dollars of research. And uh, most of them, after being published, ha nothing happens to it. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with, even with failed startups, many of these startups failed, but they really had a product. Now, the investor, this is the time. You know, it's, it's like, the, you know, the, when you don't have food, you know, you go and look into the, all the nooks and crannies and try to find out if there's a morsel up left over there. So this is the time for the government as well as the investors to look into their failed startups, to look into all the monetizable but not yet monetized inventory of uh, ideas and technologies and patents and actually bring it up. The government should definitely allow, for, for example, it's already been paid by the taxpayer, give it out, license it out, maybe an open OGL license it out to people and say, you know, here is my inventory of the proteins that I have. Here is my inventory of the supply chain collaboration technologies that I have, my connected devices that I have, or the, or the, or the, uh, the investors can, can do the same and give it to their portfolio of the companies and this is the time. This is, I think, the perfect time to rebalance some of that. And I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure, because I have done a little bit of work on this. There is so much of family jewels which are hidden, which was grandma's jewels no one was wearing. But you can repurpose it in a, on your necklace. Yes, so, so we need to go look for those jewels. I love that. Let's go look for those jewels, find them, polish them up, and put them back on the necklace. Yes. I also yes. love the fact that Luba is making tea, and she can make tea and serve it for all of us. It makes it feel like it's a real tea party. Not that American kind, the other yes. kind. Um, yes. Yes, can I quickly say something to this? Yes, because absolutely. I totally agree with you because usually uh, the visionaries who are making the product, they are not commercial thinking. They are not going to, they just want to make the product. So what the government has also done here is actually to help them franchise two investors and commercial teams to build it. And that's a really interesting way to go. Hmm. So so, yeah, this is exactly the same that has happened here, that they have actually gathered people who know about this and then asked them, within this industry, what, what should we do? What kind of, uh, what would help right now in the situation we are in now and what would help in the longer run? So instead of, of uh, figuring it out themselves, you know, gathering the best minds. And I think this whole thing about, we briefly touched on immigration, but this thing about bringing uh, different minds together is exactly what creates uh, the entrepreneurial mindset so that we, we foster that. And of course, 
research and development and also schools and how we bring up our kids in the schools and what kind of work we ask them to do is, is playing a big role in terms of, of the entrepreneurial mindset. So it's not only Israel who has this cluster, it's also the Scandinavian countries. And, and if you look at the school systems and the Nordic countries, including Iceland, how we are a challenge to do project work all the way through in schools and emotional intelligence. And I think those two things coming together is what, what creates the, the backbone of, you know, grown-ups who can think for themselves. And then, of, unfortunately, we've had situations where a lot of our bright minds have left for the Silicon Valley and, and, and set up their businesses there and their headquarters there because of, of the not enough smooth regulations um, to, to actually foster that hungriness. And, right. So that's something and, that's got to change, yeah. yeah. Can, can I start with R&D because you asked specific, specifically R&D, so this is a question. Uh, one of the reasons they're coming to the U.S. is because the U.S., just like you and other governments, have spent, as Suman said, billions of dollars on funding early research uh, for which they get zero, right? So all of that, the people that are out licensing this and licensing this technology and then startups get and an license this technology, they pay the royalties not to the government yeah. that actually funded the research, they're paying it to the venture capitalists and to the to, you know, one of these academic I institutes. The, but the migration has stopped uh, for the last. Yeah, I just, just want, I want to jump in because I want to make sure we get time. We have four minutes left. It's not right happening here. anymore. It used to happen. I, I, I just want to get to the point about Suman's point that he raised me: the digital divide. And what what we're trying to re-energize, revitalize these startup ecosystems. What is the responsibility? to kind of think about these really important societal issues as we do so. You know, STEM research, STEM education. Yeah, we need that. Obviously, that's critical. But what kind of Ming Li, what, what about China from China? How, how do you think about that issue? Uh, the digital divide uh, is a critical issue uh, for, for the future. I, I agree with that, yeah. Um, the, maybe the most important thing, I think, uh, just as you said, is education, yeah. We should invest uh, uh, our future generations here yeah, uh, to make uh, to make uh, everyone be benefited from the the, the technical change. Yeah. Got it, um, Penilla. Your thoughts? I'm going to go to each one of you. Then we're going to wrap, Penilla. Yeah. So I think uh, what we the main takeaway is is basically to get out of the way, right? <laughs> to create that hungriness and and the ability to actually. Uh, pave pave a smooth uh, way of setting up businesses and running them. And but for the digital divide, I mean, what do we do? How do we do that and actually address societal imbalance? So that's that's also uh, like Ming Li said. I think uh, investing in the future generations and really educating them well in in how we avoid this problem. Got it. Okay, Svana. I, th I think uh, I totally agree with those points, and I think like, I think we have to create more options of equal opportunities. Uh, I'm very fond of the status of basic income, so people can have you know uh, possibilities to do the things. And then coming to education, that's definitely the way to go, uh, and that's something that you really have to turn upside down for sure. And that's uh, for another panel for you know all day. Yes. Suman, briefly. I, th I think the world has enough. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, we, uh, we always have needs. The world has enough for now for what the, the basic issues are. It's it's the rebalancing uh, opportunity. And that opportunity has money. So for the startup, the people who are thinking about startups, my uh, point to do to them is there's about a 10, 12 trillion dollars of economy lying over there, which as we speak in ESG, SDGs areas, you know, technology for SDG, technology for ESG, repurposing this, balancing this, this value chain collaboration. These are, and we can, we don't have to do it for our future. I want to live my life. I don't want to live it for my child. So I want to ensure that I can do it in the next five years. And the opportunity is there today to actually make a large part of that happen, if not all of that happen. You know, as Jeffrey Sachs says, you know, we can see meaningfully in the next five years, a time when there is no uh, no poverty. So I, I, I would think it's possibility is there right now. Got it. Thanks. Luba, last but not least. Uh, very completely agree. I have to say on education part, I have uh, brilliant Harvard students that come from all over the world and they want to go in and start, start startups um, that really truly help people. And after they go and they look at regulatory hurdles and they talk to investors, they come up come back to me and they say, hey, I want to do you know a blueberry app delivery to in the city. 
Uh, so, you know, I think we have a lot on education. I think we need to support, um, support that, that excitement to make the world a better place, really. Um, and that really comes from talking to changing the, and rebalancing exactly as Kumon right. said of the power. So I have 30 seconds to wrap up. What you need to do, you need to think intelligently about how you apply funding or don't apply money, apply, you know, deregulation, let companies kind of not have to pay their registration fees or what have you. You need to think about collaboration, how you encourage the collaboration between governments and private sector. You need to deregulate. You need to give additional support to frontier technologies and think intelligently about how you do that. And finally, you need to think about the digital divide, close it. Thank you so much. It's been a great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, guys. I think we did it. I think we did it. I think we are finished. You are the time, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're we we nice nice uh, you know, Luba, uh, you know, I'm an alumni, so it kind of, I think, it, it, the, the now you tell me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> with access. Come on, you and I need yeah. to talk. Uh, <laughs> so, so. Uh, guys, you did a fantastic oh, job. Up. I'm, I'm really up. grateful to you. It's not easy at all. It's a massive subject, a lot of issues yeah. to cover. You know, doing this from a globally distributed group of people, it's a nightmare. So you did a fantastic job. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. If I cut you off at any point, I apologize. But I really felt that was mm. a, a really good flowing conversation. And if I feel it, I know the people who are listening felt it too. So really great yeah, job. It was, yeah, it was very you. well chaired. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for moderating. All right, team. Bye. 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 Cheers. Bye. How do we get out of this? <laughs> Exit. On the left, there is a door sign. Red Bye. door sign. Bye. Bye-bye. Sign here.